Hello Revolution students and welcome back to our study of the Chinese Revolution area of study one. This is going to be my final video in my series of videos on this topic. In this video I'm going to look at the Civil War and go through the reasons why the CCP won the Civil War, the most significant reasons, and the reasons why the Guomindang lost the Civil War. So without much further ado, let's get into it. So the key points, the first one here, we'll look at the CCP strengths. So the first one, and I spoke about this in the previous video on Yunnan and the Zhongfeng, um, the thought rectification campaign that was undertaken at Yunnan. Uh, that was a key strength of the CCPs and contributed to their eventual victory in the Civil War because, as you can see there, it unified them and it made them better disciplined. Next. The CCP had superior military intelligence, so they knew of Guomindang troop movements and other military plans because they had uh, spies uh, in positions of quite, uh, quite unique power in the Guomindang military hierarchy. So you can see there uh, Chung's assistant or Zhang's assistant chief of staff, General Liu Fei, and the head of the Guomindang's war planning board, Guo Board. Guo Ru Guai, I'm trying to pronounce that as well as I can, were CCP spies. So these two individuals, as well as many others, informed Mao Zedong and the CCP leadership of the most intimate plans of the Guomindang, and that helped them to defeat the Guomindang. The next key point, uh, and probably uh, the most significant of all the points, was that the CCP had the support of the peasant masses. And I remind you that the peasants made up over 90% of the population in China. And they gained that support principally from their land redistribution policies. And if you go right back to Sun Yixian's uh, San Min Zhu Yi, the three principles, and that third principle, uh, people's livelihood, where Sun Yixian dreamed of, uh, once he got into power, of creating a republic and redistributing in some form, uh, land in China so there was more equitable land ownership. Well, wherever the CCP took over, they did redistribute land. And there's a bit of information about one of their laws there. So the new land reform law in 1947 empowered peasants to redistribute land and took away all rights of landlords. So it was actually harsher than some of the uh, more moderate land redistribution policies that Mao Zedong and the CCP were following at Yunnan during, for example, um, the war with the Japanese. And I suppose they were more, they, those land redistribution policies were more moderate because they were trying to gain the support of all sections of society in a national revolution and defense against the Japanese aggression, aggressor. The next key point, the CCP had superior guerrilla warfare tactics and they were honed while fighting the Guomindang during the encirclement campaign. So we're going right back to the early 1930s. Then on the Long March, 1934 up to 1935, and then the Yunnan period, which is late 1935 onwards, and from fighting the Japanese. So I just put a little stat there. So according to the most significant battle that the CCP fought against the Japanese was this 100... 100 Regiments Campaign, Autumn 1940. According to Philip Short, 26,000 Japanese were killed or wounded. There are quite, there are varying estimates on how many Japanese were wounded, how successful the CCP were in that battle. But that's Philip Short's view anyway. The next key point, the CCP were perceived as more honest and courageous than the Guomindang. And uh, you could, you could, that could, that view of them could go right back to the Jiangxi Soviet and then the Long March and so forth. So according to Helen Snow, the CCP soldiers were Prince Valiants in straw sandals. A uh, very, very famous quote, which you can use in your responses. And then this, along with the land, re, uh, land distribution policies, contributed to mass surrender of GMD troops during the Civil War. So there were mass surrenders of GMD troops. Some of them just stopped fighting. Many of them, though, actually joined the CCP and swelled the CCP forces and contributed to their eventual victory against the Guomindang. I'll just go on to a quick quote down here. Um, and this is from Mao Zedong when, they, um, when the CCP uh, lost 
the Yunnan Soviet, when the Yunnan Soviet was taken over by the Kuomintang during the Civil War, but uh, Mao Zedong really didn't care that much. We will give uh, Chang or Zheng Jishu Yunnan. He will give us China. It is after all only caves. Empty cities don't matter. The aim is to destroy the enemy's army. And that aim of Mao's went right back to the Jiangxi Soviet in the encirclement campaigns. He was always more concerned with destroying and defeating enemy armies than taking over pieces of land and so forth. All right, let's have a look at the GMD losses. All the reasons why, sorry, the GMD lost the civil war. So the key points here, the first one, GMD weaknesses. Um, they suffered more from the war against the Japanese than the CCP. So the CCP, we know about the Yunnan Soviet. There were other smaller Soviets throughout China um, some behind Japanese lines, enemy lines, which were fighting the Japanese. They fought the Japanese, but um, yeah, the, the GMD did no doubt bear the brunt of the Japanese attacks and the Japanese bombing raids and so forth. And this view here, uh, that it was uh, completely exhausted the Kuomintang militarily, economically and spiritually. That's from Immanuel Su, that historical interpretation. I'll actually look at that in uh, a fuller extent in a sec. The next key point uh, why the GMD lost the civil war was because of poor management of the economy. Uh, so when they lost Shanghai and then Nanjing, Shanghai in particular, they got much of their tax revenue from Shanghai. And if you think back to uh, what we looked at on the GMD, they spent around 80% of their income from their tax revenue on supporting the military. So once they lost Shanghai, which much of their tax income came from, um, their ability to um, fund their military um, was damaged quite a lot. So the loss of Shanghai in November 1937 and then Nanjing in uh, the 13th of December 1937 to the Japanese weakened the political authority of the Kuomintang over the uh, Chinese people and led to, as I was saying, a loss in government revenue. Printed banknotes, uh, they printed lots of banknotes, and this leads, uh, led to hyperinflation. And we know when you have hyperinflation, the value of uh, notes, uh, paper currency, becomes pretty much worthless and it destroyed the economy. So, for example, their 100 Chinese dollars could buy two oxen in 1937, and by 1949, it could only buy a sheet of paper. And that's that I've got from uh, Tom Ryan, China Rising. Next key point. So not only did uh, the average man and woman on the street, their money became, or, you know, pretty much valueless. The wealthy, the capitalists who had all their money in the bank, all of that money uh, became worthless as well as a consequence of this hyperinflation. And we'll see in a sec that contributed to uh, the Kuomintang losing the support of the capitalists as well, and not just the peasants. Uh, and we can see their support mainly came from uh, landlords and capitalists. But uh, the Kuomintang did not undertake either industrial agricultural reform, and they used, uh, as I said before, their revenue mostly to fund the military. So they, they didn't use their money to improve uh, China in various other ways. And as a consequence of that, uh, they lost the support of, in particular, the capitalists, who were one of their main groups, of uh, one of the main classes that supported them. Next point, which is right there. So they refused to give the capitalists a political role in the party. They nationalised the banks. So the Kuomintang nationalised the banks, which means that they took the banks out of, um, they took away ownership of the banks from the capitalists. And they also taxed individuals and company profits heavily. So there was not uh, really that much in the GMD policies that was attractive to capitalists. Uh, and even though initially the capitalists did support them, over time uh, that support whittled away. The next key point, that the GMD bureaucracy was open to corruption. So public offices were bought and sold nepotism was rife so nepotism is when you give positions of power to your mates 
And another uh, significant or another piece of evidence to show this corruption was that up to 30% of foreign aid was sold on the black market. It was given to the Guomindang to give out to the people. Guomindang officials just sold it themselves to make money. The next key point, and I've referred to this previously, so the Guomindang lost the support of the peasantry. Forced conscription and ill treatment of conscripts. So we look, just going up to this image up here, this has appeared on a previous exam several years ago, and it depicts how peasants were forcibly conscripted into the GMD army. So GMD soldiers went to peasant villages and they just took males. They tied them up, they chained them up, and they marched them to conscription centres. And uh, many of these conscripts lost their lives upon the way. You can see in this image uh, the wife of one of these conscripts. This man here is crying as he's taken away. There's her child and that would be the mother or the mother-in-law. So it caused severe social dislocation. It would have caused poverty as well because uh, this conscript he would have been a farmer who worked the land, who grew food for his family to survive and he was taken away uh, and then there's some stats down here that I'll just quickly look at so according to the president of the Red Cross 14 million this was uh, 14 million conscripts died even before reaching uh, the front lines to fight the CCP okay during the Civil War so that's one reason why the peasants did not support the Guomindang the other reason here with looked at this in a previous video as well the peasants were heavily taxed so between 70 and 90 percent of their crops were taken in many areas under gmd control and the other big key point um, that we've looked at previously is that the Guomindang uh, did not implement any land reform did not redistribute land from the rich and wealthy landlords to the peasants like the ccp were doing in all areas that they took over and then there's just a quote here from General Stilwell. This is 1944, but we can apply uh, his view here of what the Guomindang was like in 1944 to what they were also like post-1945 and during the Civil War years. I judge the Guomindang and the Communist Party by what I saw. The Guomindang, corruption, neglect, chaos, economy, taxes, words and deeds, hoarding, black market, trading with the enemy, the communist program aimed to reduce taxes and rents and interest, and we saw that they did this, the CCP at Yan'an. Raised production and standard of living. If we think back to Yan'an and the literacy programs and education programs, which increased the uh, literacy levels of the peasants in Yan'an. All are big achievements by the CCP. And then participate in government, practice what, what they preach. Okay. Now let's have a look at a couple of historical interpretations on the Civil War. Next slide. So, two here. The first one you can see is by Emmanuel Sue, and the second one is by Philip Short. So the first one, Emmanuel Sue writes, To this writer, the single most important cause for the downfall of the nationalists during the Civil War was the Eight-Year Japanese War, the Second Sino-Japanese War, which completely exhausted the government militarily, financially, and spiritually. The communists, on the other hand, did not bear the brunt of fighting the Japanese war and had vastly expanded their military forces, particularly up in northern China. So according to Emmanuel Su, we can see here the key reason in his mind about why the Guomindang lost the war was they were exhausted by fighting the Japanese for eight years. Philip Short has a differing view, and he writes, The speed with which nationalist resistance crumbled astonished even him, Mao Zedong. One factor was the deterioration in the quality of the GMD armies that had followed America's entry into the Pacific War. So that's from 1941 onwards. Nationalist generals lost interest in driving out the Japanese, figuring that sooner or later their allies would do it for them. Poor intelligence compounded the nationalists' difficulties, and that links in with um, the superior intelligence um, and spies that the CCP had within the GMD hierarchy. Morale, or lack of it, was equally important. So a number of, uh, num number of points there. Lack of morale, 
um, not very good in uh, not very good military intelligence and just the deterioration of the quality of the GMD forces. Chang's was a conscript army. Press gangs went out to the villages and carried men off from their fields, leaving their families to, survive, uh, to starve. And no wonder when these conscript armies, GMD armies, faced the CCP and they had an opportunity to go over the CCP, um, that they took that opportunity and deserted en masse from the Guomindang. Uh, by the end of the Civil War, uh, Zhang Jishu had fled to Taiwan with all of uh, China's uh, gold, or the government's gold reserves, and with some forces that he could muster from the GMD, and established uh, what we know as Taiwan today. And the CCP took over the rest of China, and that ends our series of videos on China, the Chinese Revolution, area of study one. I hope you have found them uh, very useful in your study of this revolution. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.